Uh, hi everyone and welcome to the latest installment of the NZX virtual investor webinar series. Uh, we've got a great lineup for you today so I'm pretty excited to kick off. Uh, we've got presenters from the Angel Association, Michael Hill International and Property for Industry. So as always if you wish to submit questions or have any sort of tech issues please just send through a question through on the webinar system on the right. Um, so first up, we have Suze Reynolds, who is the Executive Chair of the Angels, Angel Association of New Zealand, um, an organisation that aims to increase the quantity, quality and success of angel investments in New Zealand. Suze is also an active, active angel investor and is the founder of Angel HQ, an angel network in Wellington. And with that, the floor is yours, Suze. Thanks, lovely. Thank you. It's so neat to be here. Um, thank you for this opportunity to talk about um, a passion, which for me is bone marrow deep. Um, we might touch on why I'm so passionate about it um, as we um, dance through this presentation. I want to kick off by um, very sincerely and genuinely acknowledging um, the support that Angel and Early Stage Venture Investment has had from the NZX over the last decade or so. Um, and not least um, Angel HQ, which as you mentioned, um, I co-founded uh, probably, I think it was about 12, 12, 15 years ago now. We deliberately launched, um, had a soft launch at the NZX because I was determined um, that one day soon, uh, one of the companies that we backed um, as early stage venture investors would list on the NZX. We haven't quite got there yet, um, but I have this kind of sense we're not far off. So um, I'm really looking forward to that day. I'll be there with loads of balloons and streamers um, being incredibly excited. Um, so what I want to do for you today is um, I'm just going to uh, give you a wee sense of where we've come from. Um, I mean, I've got 2006 up there, but I mean, you know, the whole sort of early stage venture scene um, was really kind of coming alive in North America in the sort of 90s, um, and then really didn't kind of catch on in New Zealand, uh, probably until sort of the last decade or so. Um, but we had nascent uh, angel investment, early stage venture investors. Many of them wouldn't call, have called themselves angels, um, and it is a slightly controversial term for some, so hence you'll hear me refer more often to early stage venture investment now. Uh, and then I'll give you a sense of where we are now, 2021, um, some really exciting statistics and numbers. Uh, of course, we have to be focused on the returns in this space too, and, um, and we need to be reminded of that because we can get quite excited about inputs, but it's really the value that we're creating that we need to focus on. And then I just thought it would be useful to share with you my personal investor journey. Um, I am, um, as was mentioned, a pretty active angel investor um, and just want to talk to you about that um, with the huge caveat that it is my personal angel investor journey. Every angel um, behaves differently, has different motivations. Um, so please bear that in mind when we get to that bit. So 2026, um, what was going on there? We were between the dot-com bubble and the GFC. Um, high growth tech was really not yet quite a thing. Um, you hear about it obviously way more now. Um, it does seem kind of incredible that um, TradeMe had um, only just sold to Fairfax and um, the zero listing was still a year or so away. The New Zealand Venture Investment Fund um, had uh, just kind of started off. Well, it had actually been around probably for four or five years. Um, They'd invested alongside six VCs um, and um, had co-invested alongside um, early stage um, venture investors to the tune of about 20 million into about sort of uh, 29 um, angel deals. New Zealand Venture Investment Fund now, um, as many of you will be aware, is called New Zealand Growth Capital Partners. Um, and um, things have moved along a hell of a lot uh, for them. Then uh, are there uh, in the last uh, 18 months or so, they've launched Elevate, which is uh, firing up again of the matching um, funding for VCs. Um, and we can get into this in the Q&A perhaps, primarily because the angel scene, the early stage venture scene had cracked on to such an extent, um, but we weren't um, filling and being able to fund uh, those follow on growth rounds, series A and B. Uh, we're now much more able to do that. Things have changed incredibly in the last 18 months or two years. Just for a bit more context, K1W1 had invested in 25 deals. Movac um, had invested in just um, four or five deals at that point. They were about to go on and raise their fund two, which was 17 million. Of course, many of you will be aware they've just recently raised um, their fund five or six, whichever it was, to, um, you know, over 250 million. Um, but at that point, um, that fund too was going to go towards backing 15 companies. Ice Angels, um, one of our Uber Angel networks in the country, um, had about 50 members. Um, 
they're now well over 200. Uh, they just invested into a company called Biomatters, which exited last year. Uh, Angel HQ was still um, a year or two from sort of launching officially. Um, we were a business unit of um, what was at that stage called um, RIDA, um, the Wellington Regional Economic Development um, Association or Network. Um, and uh, we were, um, I think in 2007, um, made an investment into a company called Green Button, which exited six years later, to, um, which was very exciting for a number of our members. Oh, how come I'm not moving forward? Oh, there we go. Um, so fast forward now, um, let's look at where we're sitting now in 2021. I'm gonna tackle this in two bites. The first is the activity or the supply side as I refer to it. Um, what number of ventures um, are we generating? You see there a sort of snapshot of the companies that um, are all venture backed, um, gives you a sense of their valuation. Um, that is just a snapshot. In actual fact, they're probably, this is a, a, this is a sort of um, a space where I can get rather jazzed um, that we um, don't have as good a data set as we should or could um, in terms of being able to be uh, definitive about the number of startups there are in New Zealand. There's all manner of definitional angst in this space. Um, you know, what an angel investor is, what a startup is. Um, pretty much a startup is a high growth company, gener generally grounded in tech, um, but with huge aspirations to create exponential impact um, and returns. So yeah, you can see the little kind of um, speech bubble there. Over the last decade or two, we've also we've invested more than a billion and 1,500 or so startups. And we just seem to be generating a cadence of about 200, or 200 to 400 startups a year. According to Startup Genome, which is um, a global um, benchmarking entity, we should be generating Sorry about that interruption by tech. Hang on, I'll just refresh that. Coming back to you, apologies, everyone. Should have turned off my phone completely so this wasn't bothering you. At least you can still see my screen a little bit. Talk quietly much to sell. I'll think it was back when the right play. And we just stopped back there, so we're back in the right place. Right, here we are. Reset. Um, yeah, the only other points I wanted to make here, of course, is that it's just really clear that we are humming in terms of um, really generating some seriously world beating startups. Um, and we want to do that even more. Our aspiration is to grow the number of startups um, from sort of 1500, 2000 that we have at the moment to sort of 10,000 in the next five to 10 years, not least because they are the world's big problem solvers and also the um, generators of most of the net new job growth in any given economy, so super important. But what about the demand side? And this gives you a sense of who's investing and how much. Um, we now have about a dozen angel networks up and down the country. Uh, Archangels is, concentrates on women-led ventures. Eno Ventures is a Chinese investor migrant network. Um, which is doing some super cool connections between our two economies and helping companies um, that want to scale up into Asia. Um, there are about 850 or 900 angels across the dozen or so networks. Um, the Angel Association has gone from sort of a dozen or so members to over 50 members now representing the early stage um, tech um, scene, um, a number of early stage venture funds, a number of law firms, um, the likes of Jardin and others who are really keen and can see the strategic imperative behind um, our backing more startups. In fact, I have a little hashtag, every Kiwi should back or build a startup um, that I'm really pumping out hard at the moment, just um, as a reflection of just how important I think this space is. Um, so we are now investing, as you can see from that graph, um, for the last three years, over 100 million per annum um, into sort of between sort of um, about 100 deals a year, about a third of those are um, new deals and about two thirds follow on. The whole maturing of the ecosystem is reflected in the first half data this year where we've seen a, a real increase in the number of big deals. So about nine or 10 companies raising greater than 10 million. We've kept that data in our data set because those companies that we're raising still have angel funds um, and angel um, angels investing in those rounds. And so we want to reflect the maturing of the ecosystem. Um, so my personal angel investment journey, I've been investing for about eight years. Um, I've invested in about 20 companies directly and in about three funds. Um, Movac Fund 5 being one of them, 
Lightning Lab XX, which was backing women-led founders. Um, and I've also in, uh, invested in Xeno Ventures Fund as well. Now I write what I call my two packets of chocolate biscuits worth size checks, five to 10K checks, and no more than sort of 25, 30K in any individual deal. Um, I'm probably representative of about, of that 850 or so angels I mentioned. I would say at least half of that group write that sort of size check. Then there's another chunk of sort of, I don't know, 30, 40% who write checks more along the size of sort of 15 to 25, 30K every time they go into an angel back venture. Um, and then there's a smaller proportion of our really deep pocketed angels who will write sort of circa 100, 200K checks. Um, and this is bearing in mind that to really generate the IRI that you should encode from this asset class, you need to have a portfolio of at least 20 companies. So that gives you a sense of the degree of wealth um, that you need to have. Um, and annual risk profile. I often say that this is less about a wealth profile and more about a personality profile that has the wealth um, to be able to invest in this asset class. But it is hugely rewarding just in terms of the difference that it can make to the world and the kinds of technology inventors that it's bringing to the world. I've had three exits so far. One of those was uh, three times, two of them were three times my money back. One of them was an eight times my money back. The IRR on those three exits was between 40 and 60%. The unrealized IRR on my portfolio is about 20%, which is, you know, it's okay. It's not great, uh, could, should be better. But if you bear in mind that most of my portfolio has only been invested um, in the last sort of five years, um, I've still got another sort of five to 10 years for that for those ventures to be proving themselves or not. Also worth mentioning that 90% of your returns in this asset class from 10, come from 10% of your investment. Um, as I say there, I've lost all my money on one venture and my investment is pretty much MIA and a couple of others where they've been, those startups have been absorbed into other entities which don't have quite the aspiration that a high growth startup should. And I'm on the board of a couple of startups. I helped the startup raise um, uh, sort of million dollar plus round this year. Um, and I'm really kind of getting amongst it. It's hugely rewarding. Um, this is just gives you a wee reflection of the kinds of companies that I'm in. Um, pretty chuffed to be an early sharesies investor. Um, and they're probably going to be one of my 10% generating the 90% of returns at some stage. Um, I've invested about 185k of that 250 I mentioned there. Um, and, and as I say, um, I'm still on the journey big time. Um, that about brings me um, sort of to the end of, of my presentation. Um, I hope that's kind of done the trick. I'm very happy to take some questions at this point. Um, and uh, yeah, um, if you wanted to kind of button into us, then we've got some contact details too for you to learn some more. Thanks, Suze, that was great. Um always love seeing an insight into that type of investing, especially from someone of myself that's only ever invested into like the public space. So really eye opening. Um, so we've got a couple of questions here from the audience. Um, first one here is, uh, which startup investment are you currently most excited about? That could be in your portfolio or outside as well even. Yeah, it's always like, I always say that it's a wee bit like asking someone who their favorite child is. <laughs> it's, bit, it's kind of challenging to out that. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, and I don't say this kind of disingenuously, really genuinely, I, I invest in companies that as well as going after a really huge market and that I believe are gonna have the capacity potential to generate those really meaningful returns. I invest in companies that I think are making the world a better place. Um, yeah. and, um, and so, you know, companies like Narrative News and Sharesies looking to democratize access to public markets. Um, you know, they are seriously awesome. Kogo is another company that I'm super proud to be a nano shareholder of, looking to kind of really change our ability to connect with um, doing and behaving how we should um, to make the planet um, a safer, more sustainable um, place to be too. No, definitely. That's a great way to invest. Um, another one is NZ is known for its DIY nature. Uh, do you find that this is a case for a lot of early stage companies across the New Zealand ecosystem? Oh, yeah, that's such a great question. Um, yeah, I, I think another way of sort of framing that DIY thing is that we have this kind of sense that we should could be able to do it all by ourselves. We're not terribly good at asking others for support. Um, and it's one of the um, Kind of aspirations we have for um, amplifying the cadence of exits and returns from this asset class is that um, is that we bring startup founders together more to support each other um, and encourage each other because it's 
I mean, I was, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, I was mulling on whether or not there are any statements that you can make that are 100% true all the time in this space. Like you should always in the first round take no more than 30% of the cap table and all those kind of things. And I went yeah. through a whole bunch of stuff along this. Like the only thing I could land on that I thought, yeah, everybody would agree with this. Like, you know, there is no context where this wouldn't be true. And that's the notion that this is really, really hard, you know, scaling high growth tech companies. But when it goes off, it's super rewarding. Um, and everybody would agree with that. There wouldn't be anybody from all kinds of venture investors to all kinds of angels who wouldn't agree with that. But pretty much everywhere else, as I intimated when I talked about every angel is different, every, we pretty much, actually, I guess one other thing, I think maybe people wouldn't always be honest about it, but you make, you tend to make decisions, emotional kind of decisions and connections, and then you validate it, justify it by digging in to, you know, to markets and scaling opportunities and where the returns might be afterwards. But I think that's another thing that's we pretty much share across it. But to the DIY thing, yeah, I wish we would um, support each other more. I always say that in the same way it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a whole country to raise a startup. And that yep. means government, that means professional service providers, that means wealth management providers, KiwiSaver. We all have a role to play in building the portfolio of high growth startups that we have in New Zealand. No, great, that was very comprehensive. Thank you very much. Um, Got a couple more questions in a couple more minutes here as well. So um, we've got one here. There's a lot going on in the space exploration at the moment, uh, especially in New Zealand. Um, is there any potential here for NZ Angel investors? Absolutely. Uh, Dawn Aerospace is um, one of those companies that's um, had early stage venture backing. Ice Angels is heavily um, into Dawn Aerospace and a number of others. So yeah, 100%. I mean, and it's a growing space for us. We have some really unique comparative advantages that make New Zealand a pretty, um, a pretty enticing um, ecosystem for people who want to um, get into that sector. Definitely. Um, another one, uh, do you have an exit strategy for each investment that you make or any kind of KPIs or along that kind of regard? Um, yeah, I love that question. I tend to be um, the person at pitch nights who always says, Tim, what's your exit strategy? I'm sorry to ask. But I'm, and it's not, it really isn't being mesmerized by that is kind of the wrong approach because what you're looking to do is to grow a truly awesome company. And the exit, as we refer to, is actually just part of the um, sort of journey to creating exponential value and impact, um, particularly in a New Zealand context where we don't have the degree of um, experience, although that's, that's we're getting there really, really fast. But more acutely, we don't have the kind of degree of wealth or um, kind of, I know, depth um, to be able to, to fire on a lot of our really high growth tech companies with the level of capital and capability that they need to really make a difference in the world. So I think, yes, you always go into these angel investments thinking about when and how the return for you as an early stage investor is going to happen. And it's important you ask those questions because you need to be aligned with the founder and the company about how they're going to go about creating that exponential value. But really being conscious that, you know, the exit or the return for you as an early stage venture investor is just part of the journey of scaling that awesome tech or company or service product that the founder has originally alighted on. Awesome. Um, I think we've got time for one more. Uh, let's go with uh, companies are staying private for longer and valuations are getting higher and higher. Do you have any thoughts on this? I uh, Yeah, and yes, I do. I think that's a really, it's a very um, well-made point. Um, and I was talking to some colleagues in the US um, the other day who were making precisely that point. It worries me a little bit in a slightly sort of deeply philosophical sort of sense in that um, it's making um, that sort of wealth inequity um, bigger and bigger because only people with the means can invest in those companies, be part of those companies, and then you exacerbate that wealth divide. And yet, on the flip side, um, there are increasing number of platforms like Catalyst and like Snowball and others, which are enabling, and Sharesies for that matter too, which are enabling, you know, private investors, um, people who might not have the more sort of typically, you know, deep pockets, um, big wealth profile to invest um, in privately held companies. So I think there's definitely hope there. I'd love to see that amplified a, a, a massive amount to kind of make it yeah. um, that makes sense and be more accessible to more people. Can imagine quite a few of our audience will also really appreciate that statement. Um, but thank you very much for your time, Suze. Uh, if anyone has any more further questions, feel free to flick them on and we'll try and get them to you 
as soon as yes. possible, I guess. Thank you so much. Um, so up next, we will have Daniel Bracken, who is the CEO and Managing Director of Michael Hill International that I'm sure many of you will know, um, a very well-known retail jewellery chain that operates in New Zealand, Australia and Canada. Uh, Daniel has more than 25 year, years experience in managing some of the world's most iconic retail brands. And with that, take it away, Daniel. Thank you, James. And uh, what a great presentation from Sue's tough act to follow. Um, mine's probably going to be a little bit more formal. Um, so today, we're going to take you through a quick overview of our FY21 results, uh, a strategic update, uh, and give you some insights on our first quarter 22 trading results that we announced last week. Um, so starting with FY21, uh, the board of management could not have been more delighted to have delivered record financial results. FY21 was or has been a, fa a fantastic year for the company. All of our metrics were up. A credit, I guess, to both the execution of our strategic initiatives and the dedication and resilience of our team. The year saw record statutory earnings before interest and tax of $72 million, representing a significant EBIT increase of $58 million on the prior year, largely driven by improved sales and margin, which together delivered $51 million lift in gross profit. These outcomes were delivered while successfully navigating significant disruption from the global pandemic. Over 10,000 lost store trading days, half of our Canadian stores were closed for Gosh, almost half the year. Um, our stores in Victoria were closed for more than three months and we had multiple short, sharp, temporary closures across our global network. Focus management of our key Indian supply chain meant the pandemic impacts in India, which I'm sure some of you will remember, uh, were really, really significant, but did not significantly disrupt our inventory. And other sourcing regions across Europe and China remained relatively unimpacted. Of course, throughout the year, always at the forefront of our minds is prioritising the ongoing health, safety and well-being of our team members and our customers as a retail business. That was obviously a key priority for us. From a results perspective, the business has delivered both strong sales growth and margin expansion in all three markets, delivering further validation that our transformation is on track. Our reinvigorated retail leadership demonstrated their commitment to further embedding our retail fundamentals, which saw increases in all metrics, ATV, IPS, and conversion were all up. Our brilliance by Michael Hill loyalty program went from strength to strength with over 800,000 members. And the team also worked tirelessly to roll out additional omni-channel offerings, including ship from store, click and reserve, and virtual selling. I will elaborate on the progress we've made in those strategies further in the presentation. It should be noted our transformation agenda touches every single aspect of our business, and I couldn't be happier with how the team is working together to deliver common goals as we further strengthen and elevate the Michael Hill brand. This outstanding result is the culmination of over two years of hard work building and executing our strategy best evidenced by eight quarters of comparative sales growth together with sustained margin expansion. So moving now on to strategy, uh, we have seven strategic pillars at Michael Hill. Uh, you can see them in front of you. These pillars are underpinned by a number of initiatives that continue to deliver our transformation agenda. All of those initiatives are focused on sales growth and margin expansion, driving efficiencies with, within the business, elevating the Michael Hill brand, and enabling a true omni-channel customer experience. Moving on to a little bit more of a deep dive on those pillars, uh, starting with brand, the elevation of the Michael Hill brand is definitely gaining traction as it continues to evolve into a modern, differentiated, omni-channel jewelry brand. Transitioning our messaging from discount-led promotions to quality, and aspirational brand-led campaigns is key to enticing a broader customer while generating higher ATV and margin growth. Our messaging will continue to highlight our reinvigorated Australian manufacturing division with an emphasis on craftsmanship and local artisans. 
and our customer facing messaging will further be enhanced by data and insights from customer segmentation and personalization programs. Moving on to digital, it's very much at the forefront of our transformation with an emphasis on customer experience, product offering and fulfillment. Following another exceptional year of growth, investment in our highest profit margin channel continues to focus on incremental traffic, high conversion rates and increased transaction value. The digital business achieved record sales of $35 million in FY21 and is now more than 6% of company sales. During the year, we also saw the launch of our new Pure Play Demi Fine brand Medley, uh, only just released uh, to the New Zealand market in the last couple of weeks. And our early foray into third party digital channels has provided us the confidence now to develop an integrated marketplace solution that will be rolled out in the first half of FY22. In fact, we rolled that out last week. Um, and looking further afield, we have identified opportunities to explore more digital channels in more markets, international growth opportunities. Our digital business is well placed for continual growth, underpinned by omni-channel offerings and coupled with an elevated focus on conversion rate optimization. Now, with 285 stores across three countries, bricks and mortar retail is at the core of the Michael Hill business. Our retail fundamental strategy is focused on driving increased sales, high margins, lower costs, and a modern differentiated customer experience, all underpinned by our new retail incentive scheme. In addition, roster optimization, a focus on visual excellence, and increased training continue to be areas of focus for our retail leadership team. The key retail metrics of ATV, average transaction value, IPS, that's items for sale, and conversion, all increased in all markets in FY21 and will continue to be key areas of focus. Supporting our bricks and mortar and digital strategies, uh, Omnichannel is also a key focus for the company. And following the rollout of our new ERP platform in FY21, that enabled us to roll out Omnichannel at Michael Hill. Initially, we successfully tested and trialed virtual selling, click and reserve, and ship from store. Pleasingly, ship from store has delivered many cost and customer experience benefits, while click and reserve has contributed sizable incremental sales and in-store upselling opportunities. Having already seen the benefits for ATV in trialing these new customer channels, these initiatives, together with digital appointments, will now progressively be rolled out across our global network. And further connecting our physical and digital businesses, we will be launching, in fact, we have launched, Click and Collect for Christmas 21, delivering more incremental sales and an enhanced customer experience. Moving on to loyalty. While the Brilliance by Michael Hill program is only 18 months old, it has already grown to over 800,000 members. We've been focused on acquisition as our priority, but as we continue that focus, the business is now focusing its attention on the opportunities of activation and retention. Our early insights already provide confidence that the program is resonating with our customers, delivering increased frequency, larger baskets, and higher margins. Coupled with predictive analytics and increased personalization, both of which are being enabled by an investment into data analytics and artificial intelligence, these will deliver further growth across the business. Now touching on product. Product is the foundation of any customer-led retail strategy and is critical to continued sales and margin growth. The business will maintain its focus on regular product newness, so regularly dropping new inventory into our stores and uniquely Michael Hill branded product as a key differentiator in the categories and markets in which we operate. The business now delivers regular product newness to excite our customers and increase sales with significantly lower inventory and higher margins. Our Australian manufacturing division has been reinvigorated, delivering new bridal collections and increased speed to market, underpinned by a focus on craftsmanship, quality, innovation 
and still driving improved margins. And our entry into laboratory-grown diamonds continues to gain momentum and deliver significant margin growth. And the recently relaunched Sir Michael Hill designer bridal collection, our most premium bridal range, is already showing fantastic results. As we place greater emphasis on sustainability of our products, we look forward to providing further targeted messaging and insights in the months ahead. And finally, the company's significantly improved net cash position and targeted inventory position at the year end demonstrate that a cost conscious culture exists across every aspect of the company. We continue to optimize the global supply chain, improve the global store network, and enhance our credit propositions globally, including the upcoming divestment of our in-house Canadian credit book. Additionally, the new Canadian 3PL facility will be fully operational for peak Christmas trade, servicing both online customers and stores, optimizing inventory, reducing logistics cost, and enhancing the overall Canadian productivity and customer experience. And now as a final update, uh, I will briefly touch on Michael Hill's FY22 Q1 results. We released these results only last week uh, for the first quarter, which were particularly pleasing, delivering double digit same store sales growth of plus 15%, continued margin improvement, making our ninth quarter of positive same store sales growth since FY19 Q3. These results reaffirm our transformational agenda is enhancing all aspects of the business, broadening our omni-channel offering, elevating our brand and delivering growth. For the quarter, our digital sales surged up 58% against FY21 Q1, representing over 9% of sales for the total company. That being said, the business does and did continue to experience significant trading disruption with over 7,000 lost trading days compared to only 2,000 lost in the same period last year. That represents a net loss of 20% of the Q1 trading days against the prior year. And despite this, our all store sales were only down 10% for the quarter against FY21 Q1. Our strategic initiatives driving elevated margins and intense focus on costs and strong digital and physical sales have all combined to lessen the negative impact on earnings from sustained store closures across Australia and New Zealand. Upon reopening, our Canadian business has been absolutely flying, delivering impressive sales and margin growth every week of the year. This demonstrates that as territories reopen, the business is ready to meet the strong customer demand with the right inventory, engaged team members, and an appropriate approach to safety across our network. We're looking forward to the progressive reopening of our New South Wales, Victorian, and Auckland stores in readiness for the all important Christmas trading period. Now that brings me to the end of our official presentation. Um, James, uh, obviously happy to take some questions if you've managed to have any come your way during that brief update on Michael Hill. Um, thank you very much for that, Daniel. That was really insightful. It's always really interesting to see like such a deep, I guess, insight into a company that I guess most of us here will have grown up with or seen over the last 20 years or so of our lives really expand through both New Zealand and Australia, wherever you're from. Um, we've had three questions come through so far, so I'll start with the top. Um, digital, digital sales has been such an enormous increase over the last two years. Has this made you rethink how you might increase Michael Hill's uh, brand presence globally? That's a really, really good and appropriate question. Um, certainly, uh, our expansion into international markets through physical stores has been a major learning curve for the business over the the last 20 years, we had one success and arguably one failure. So Canada uh, today, 86 stores, James, um, and a very profitable business now, but it's taken us 15 plus years to build that. Uh, we did have a, a go in the US market and uh, withdrew from that before I joined the business probably four years ago um, because we were unsuccessful there. And 
opening new markets for physical stores is definitely a very cash intensive model. Um, so certainly the growth was seen in digital, uh, which you know we we anticipate continuing at the sort of rate that we're growing it at at the moment over the next few years does give us optimism for new markets. Um, it's why we focused, and I touched on it in the presentation, on a marketplace strategy. So we're about to, or we have in fact just launched a partnership with the Iconic here in Australia, which is a digital marketplace. We've built an integration, so our website effectively talks to their website. It allows us to surface five, six, seven hundred units of our range on their website, but it's managed through the Michael Hill back end. And um, we look to roll that out into New Zealand with the Iconic. We're now looking at a Canadian partnership to do the same thing. And I was, our thoughts have already gone to, well, if this marketplace model works for us, why wouldn't we go into new international markets? It's a low capital, low cost way of testing whether our brand resonates. And, and if we can if we can prove that model in new international markets, why wouldn't we then follow a marketplace strategy with a michaelhill.com strategy? So it's absolutely on our digital roadmap to explore those options. Awesome. I guess the only constraint there might be supply if you get too many sales. Oh, um, well, that would be a nice problem for any retailer to have. Um, we've got one other question here on the uh, opportunity in Canada. If you're able to explain a bit more, I guess, looking forward, what your what your strategy is there. I mean, you just talked about how you have over 80 stores there now over many, many years. Is there much more room for growth in that market? So I, th I think our Canadian business, um, when I joined Michael Hill two and a half years ago, underperformed to the New Zealand and Australian businesses. So we didn't get the same levels of uh, productivity and by productivity I mean sales per square meter it's a classic way retailers measure their performance uh, and we were underperforming in the Canadian market we put a lot of work in a lot of changes over the last two years um, you don't get 17 percent like for like sales in the first quarter without a lot of change going on in the business so our focus in Canada has not been further expansion it's been about driving efficiencies and driving productivity up um, we certainly achieved a lot over the last four years. We've, the last three years, sorry, we've increased productivity by about 30% in the Canadian market. We think there's a bit more to go, um, maybe another 10 to 15%. Um, there is one territory in Canada we've chosen not to go into. Um, that's the French speaking part, Quebec. Uh, yep. And the reason for that is that enters a whole new world of, of languages uh, that we have to communicate into our customers. That being said, you know, might we choose to look at Quebec through a digital lens, much easier for us to manage. So from a physical store perspective, we're 86 today, excluding Quebec. Maybe there's room for 90, but, but we're broadly maxed out from a distribution perspective, but that distribution owes us more. Yep. Um, I think we've got time for one more question here from the audience. Um, let's see, as a retail business, are you concerned about the current macro environment, for example, the rising interest rates and inflation? Yeah, look, I think we've all we've all had this sort of honeymoon of a couple of well, not not really a honeymoon, but on one aspect, on interest rates, we've had a honeymoon for the last couple of years. Um, we certainly, in, in all of our markets, particularly Australia and New Zealand, there's a question over, are we benefiting from a trapped economy? Um, our view in both those markets, by the way, is while we may have benefited domestically, we've missed out on a lot of international tourist business that we used to get. Um, so we, we actually think the two kind of neutralize each other out. Um, and look, interest rates and inflation was bound to respond. There's been a lot of cash flowing around all the, all the major developed countries in the world through arguably some level of overstimulation. Um, it does have to hit a norm at some point, uh, and I think we're just starting to see that. From a Michael Hill perspective, um, we've managed increasing gold prices. Gold's been at its all-time high. You know, it's a, it's a safe haven commodity that people go to in difficult times, and we've, we've had to manage through that. Diamonds are trading pretty much at an all-time high. We've managed both of those impacts um, and kept our margin moving up. So, you know, 
we're not looking forward to it, but we're confident that the strategies, James, that we've got in place in the business will be strong enough to counter that. No, that's great. Thank you very much, Daniel. And if anyone from the audience has any further questions, feel free to send them through. And I'm sure we'll be able to get those back to you soon. Thanks very much, James. Um, and so for lastly, we have Simon Woodhams, uh, the CEO of PFI, Property for Industry. Uh, they are an NZX listed investment vehicle with a focus on the industrial property sector. Uh, Simon was appointed CEO in 2019 and prior to that he was GM for mm -hmm. over five years. Uh, take it away, Simon. Thanks James for the introduction and well done to the previous presenters. Um, it's always good to hear what other people are experiencing and seeing in the markets. So really interesting and thanks very much for having me today and thank you to everyone who's listening. I think we've got close to 150 people dialed in, have taken time out of their day, so appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna give a very high level overview of property for industry or PFI as we refer it to it as, um, what our purpose is, where we've come from, um, as well as running through just very briefly our June 30 financial results and then speaking to just some of the recent initiatives we've been undertaking over the um, well, over this year, really over the last nine or so months. And then if we've got time, um, I think we've got little Q&A at the end there. So just moving through to the first slide, which has been pushed through by Cass in another location. Um, just so you know, we're speaking from Auckland here, so we are in lockdown. Um, so some of you probably know the PFI story or the property industry story. Um, hopefully some of you are shareholders listening in today, but we were established back in 1993. Um, so we've been around for a long time. The company has always had a focus on industrial property. Um, and our stated purpose is uh, to generate income for our investors as professional landlords to the industrial economy. And we think if we do that well, it should in turn generate prosperity for the wider New Zealand market. Uh, we've got a very good track record of delivering for our investors uh, since inception. So since 1993, our uh, annualised returns, total returns, 11.31%. Uh, uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit of detail shortly. We currently own a very well diversified property portfolio of 96 properties. Um, we lease those properties to 149 tenants. Um, probably the key point to drag out of this slide here is uh, in the top left hand corner there that as at June 30, the portfolio is valued in excess of $2 billion. Uh, so therefore, when you look at the New Zealand market, we're a property company of significant scale. Um, we've got a very good track record of occupancy. Currently the portfolio is 99.5% occupied. Uh, over the last 10 years though, the average occupancy at year end is 98.5%. Uh, we take this as a really good indication that our buildings continue to be fit for purpose and are attractive to the wider tenant market, which is important. Uh, the average lease term within our portfolio sits at 4.8 years. Um, that's the WALT there. Uh, and the average value of our property is around $20 million. Uh, the company's got a reputation of having a clear low risk strategy. Uh, our company gearing currently sits at just 30% uh, and our strategy is executed by a very experienced management team that I lead. Uh, some of us have been involved in the company for over or well over a decade now. Let's jump through that next slide, Cass, thank you. Um, the majority of our portfolio is based here in Auckland where our HQ is, 85% um, of the portfolio. We see this as the strongest and deepest market in the country. It's obviously the biggest city. Uh, the balance of our portfolio is spread pretty much through the North Island and into the South Island. We think having a national footprint is important. A lot of our larger tenants tend to have a national footprint and it allows us to work with them up and down the country. Uh, the rest of the slide highlights some of the reasons why we love or like industrial property. Uh, on average, the size of our portfolio, the, the, the properties are 7,250 square metres of building. Um, so that's obviously a lot smaller than a shopping centre or an office tower. It means they're more generic, can be traded, bought and sold more easily, more liquid. And top industrial property tends to have a lower um, number of tenants per property. So um, generally it's one tenant per property. We average about one and a half tenants per property. That in turn means they're easier to be managed, less management intensive when you look at a shopping centre or an office tower. Uh, and finally, due to how they're constructed, generally our properties have a small single level office uh, with a large warehouse constructed out of uh, concrete and steel out the back. You tend to have lower levels of capital expenditure through the life cycle of an asset and you tend to have lower seismic risk, which we think is important. 
The next slide uh, here, we tend to put into our presentations. Um, I talked about it earlier, but I think it highlights not only for property for industry, but in generally the industrial property market tends to enjoy high levels of occupancy. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, over the last 10 years, we have run at 98.5% uh, with a weighted average lease term or average lease term of over five years. And for us, these two metrics are really the lifeblood of the company and should be for any property company, really. If you can keep your properties full and your tenants paying your rent, it should allow you to drive growing returns and dividends to your shareholders, which we think is very important. So as I mentioned earlier, we've got a very good uh, reputation for having strong governance and management. Um, the company, when it was listed back in 1993, was run by AMP Capital. Uh, the current management team took the company over in 2011. Uh, and you can see from then, uh, since uh, 2011, the portfolio sat at about $370 million. Through a series of strategic actions, we've grown the company significantly. Uh, and we're now over that $2 billion mark. Uh, and that's provided us with some really good momentum going forward. Our board of directors um, is comprised of five directors, four independent and one non-executive director. The average tenure of our director is uh, 11 years. And Ant Beverly, who's our chairman, has been involved in the company uh, for 18 years now. So we've got really good continuity uh, and stable governance that allows us to operate well uh, as a company. So I've talked about the, the long stable history um, that PFI's had, and I mentioned total returns for the last 20 odd years of 11.3% per annum. On this slide, we've just tracked really the last five years. And you can see over this period, we have significantly grown our operating revenue and our asset base, uh, but at the same time, we managed to keep our gearing levels low. So it hasn't been growth for growth's sake. It's been very targeted growth uh, with the intention of growing our dividends or our returns to the shareholders. Uh, and pleasingly, we've managed to do this. Uh, our earnings have increased by more than 28% over the last five years, which for a property company uh, is exceptional, really. That's sort of covered off the recent background uh, of PFI. Um, the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about our recent results and then talk about some of the initiatives that we've taken over the, the last couple of months. So firstly, looking at our recent interim results. So we have a June 30 interim result date. Uh, and in August, we reported our earnings growth. Um, interim profit after tax was up significantly, $273 million. Um, and the measures that we used to calculate our dividends were also in great shape, our FFO and FO measures there, which was pleasing. Um, as part of that um, profit, we reported some very strong valuation gains. Uh, we revalued 94 properties in June, the whole portfolio, and we recorded an increase of 14.5% or $240 million as a result. Um, these valuation gains then transferred into an increase in our NTA, or net tangible assets. And these were up 50.5 cents, or 22.9%, uh, resulting in an NTA of $2.71 uh, cents per share. Uh, one thing to note just before we jump off that slide is with recent uh, evidence in the market and the research that we're seeing, we're anticipating further growth in our NTA at the end of the year. We revalued the whole portfolio again in December, uh, and there's still been a compression of uh, yields out there, and the market's still very active. I'll just take you through that on the next slide. So if you look forward, the market that we operate in, which is obviously the industrial property market, um, has a very robust outlook. Um, in our recent report, the research arm of the real estate company CBRE noted that investment markets will continue to benefit from renewed monetary stimulus being implemented by reserve banks around the world. Um, this low interest rate environment that we operate in uh, and the significant weight of capital from investors out there seeking yielding investment has kept demand at an all time high, um, especially in industrial property. And we're still seeing that here in New Zealand. Um, CBRE uh, tracked 12 asset classes here in New Zealand. They're currently ranking second industrial first uh, with a total forecast return of 10.6 per annum over the next five years. And then prime industrial, the third asset class, um, with a forecast total return of 9.6% over the next five years. So, you know, they're tracking 12 asset classes there, and the, 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 the ones that we own and operate in, prime and secondary industrial property, sit right at the top of the pyramid, which is pretty pleasing. Jump through to the next. So this slide here talks around um, this thematic of e-commerce. Um, obviously, you heard Michael Hill. I'm talking about it there with Daniel from Michael Hill, sorry. 
um, and the penetration uh, as a reflection of the COVID pandemic that's continued through into 2021. Online sales in New Zealand are expected to grow from the current 11% to 17% by 2025. And just as a result of those growth in sales, it's estimated that an additional 230,000 square metres or nearly a quarter of a million square metres of warehouse will be required by 2025. That plays really well into um, our portfolios uh, in terms of we've got a very well located set of properties close to the key transport links. Um, so our sector is expected to perform very well out there and we're confident that PFI is positioned to take advantage of that growth. Jump through. So the next set of slides here, I'm going to take you through a couple of key initiatives we've been working on over the last 12 to 18 months really. Uh, but before I do, it's probably just timely to step back and review what our purpose, vision and strategy is, is here. I touched on our purpose previously. So again, we see it very clearly as generating um, income for our shareholders or investors by being professional landlords in the industrial economy. Our vision sets out what to us success looks like. Uh, our drive is to be best in class. Uh, and we do that by assessing ourselves against four measures, uh, that being performance, quality, reputation and scale. And our strategy sorry, acknowledges that it requires us to be intentional and proactive as a management team and to build authentically on what we already have. The way we look at it, it's our strategy prevents us from just being a passive investor, riding what is currently a very strong rising market. Instead, the emphasis is on prudently but deliberately creating value for our shareholders. And essentially, we do this by following two um, processes. The first one is first class management. Uh, and then the second one is looking to continuously uh, improve our portfolio. And these are both actions that we expect of ourselves as a team, but also we think our shareholders should expect from us as well. And if we can execute on these two things, then we believe growing returns to shareholders should be the outcome of that. So it's pretty simple, really. Let's just jump into the next slide. So to enable us to continually improve this portfolio, we look at the composition of it. We break our portfolio down into four distinct categories or buckets as we refer to them here in the office. Um, and this allows us to drive or focus on driving growing returns for the shareholders. So as at June 30, um, our portfolio is comprised of 73% of core generic holdings. So these are just generic warehouses that appeal to a very wide range of tenants. Um, they should have long-term leases in place and, and real bottom drawer investments. We hold 15% of our portfolio sits in what we call brownfield or add value um, opportunities. These are properties that if you take capital and add them to, you should be able to drive better returns. Um, and I'll talk about one of those shortly. We have 6% of assets held for sale uh, and 6% of specialised assets. And the specialised assets are typically um, things like cool stores or bulk stores, assets that don't appeal to a wide range of tenants, uh, have a narrow range, but you tend to get higher returns off them. Um, so over the next three slides, I'll just take you through some of the recent initiatives we've undertaken, but keep those categories in mind. So the first one is 670 and 680 Rosebank Road. So back in January, we completed the acquisition of this property. Uh, we consider this a core asset. Uh, it's located on the Rosebank Road Peninsula. For those of you out of Auckland, it's about a 10 minute drive from the Auckland CBD to the west on the Northwestern Motorway. The reason we were attracted to this property uh, is the size, so we paid $39 million for it, had a weighted average lease term of just over four years. Uh, the acquisition yield was about 4.4%. Uh, we bought it off market, which was attractive. Um, but we also own the, the neighbouring estate properties, which is 5.8 uh, hectares in size. So when we combined this property with our existing holdings, we created a, an industrial estate, which is 8.6 hectares in size, adjacent to the Northwestern Motorway. Uh, which is now valued in excess of $125 million. Uh, over the medium to long term, our intention here is to create further shareholder value by integrating the two properties uh, into uh, one site-wide estate and allows us uh, some opportunities around redevelopment and repositioning tenants within the estate. So that's a core generic holding that we, we acquired earlier this year. Uh, one of our key uh, brownfield or add value opportunities that we have within the portfolio is located, again, it's here in Auckland, 30 to 32 Bowden Road, Mount Wellington. Uh, Mount Wellington is about a 15 minute drive from the CBD heading south. Uh, we like to think of it as the probably the key industrial estate or, or precinct, sorry, within Auckland. A lot of property located here. Um, this property has a final lease expiry in the first quarter of 2023, so about 15, 16 months away. 
Uh, and over the last six months, we've been working um, with our architects and planners, et cetera, to redevelop, to come up with a redevelopment plan. Uh, the site's nearly four hectares in size, so it's significant. Um, and we've got the ability to construct uh, 22,000 square metres of new warehouse uh, facilities. So the intention really is come Q2 2023, we will demolish the existing obsolete buildings in 1960s build and build a brand new estate there. Gives PFI the opportunity of committing up to $60 million of capital to this estate and the returns that will drive off that will outweigh what you could buy in the industrial property market at this point. Um, we received some really good leasing interest on this already um, and that reflects again the strong industrial market that we're operating in. This is the second to last slide. Um, so uh, assets held for sale. Um, highlighted here on this slide. We've never been afraid to sell assets. We think um, a really good way of improving the portfolio is taking assets that sit towards the end of their life cycle. If there's not the ability to invest their own capital, we're not afraid to divest them, take the money received and then invest that uh, back into better quality assets. Uh, earlier in the year we announced the, um, the sale of Carlow Park. This is due to sale, uh, sorry, settle towards the end of uh, November, start of December. Um, it's a $110 million asset. Um, uh, obviously non-industrial, our largest non-industrial asset. Um, the other asset that we have shown here is a small um, waterside asset we own down in Wellington, Bar and Event Centre, Shed 22, used to be the old Max Brewery down there for those in Wellington. Uh, we're just currently finishing up some seismic works on that property and the intention is to take that to market uh, in Q1 next year, uh, once they're hopefully back up and trading. Um, but the key point to take out of this slide is once we sell both these assets and sell, settle them out, our portfolio will be 100% industrial, which has been a focus for us over the last 24 months, and our pro forma gearing across the portfolio will sit at just 25%, so it gives us some real runway to go out and carry on with our initiatives. So, last slide. To sum it all up, um, I hope you understand we've got a very clear purpose here at PFI, it's to deliver strong, growing returns for our investors. Um, the company is in a very robust position. We have an excellent portfolio that's well leased. We've got a strong balance sheet with low levels of gearing uh, and a fantastic experienced team in place that's uh, been executing on a big body of work. Over the last nine months, we've undertaken a, a lot of work um, and we've delivered earnings growth, valuation growth, and seen a lot of our priorities advance, which is very pleasing. Uh, you overlay that our sector of the market, which is the industrial property market, has performed exceptionally well in the last five years uh, and is forecast to do so. We think we're very well positioned to take advantage of that future growth or withstand any headwinds that may be out there. Um, so that concludes my presentation. I think I've run to time which is well and uh, James uh, I'll hand it back to you but there's some time there for a couple of questions I would imagine. Exactly, and property I think is still front of mind for I guess every single New Zealander busy tuning in. So this is a very insightful uh, presentation for all of us. Thank you very much. Um, let's quickly rattle off a couple of questions. Uh, we can run over by a couple of minutes. Um, so with the increase in valuations, does this include the reassessment of insurance costs? The re I'm not quite sure. You're talking about increased premiums, I'd imagine, insurance premiums. Imagine, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So how it works is um, the majority or all of our leases are considered what's net leases. So the insurance cost gets passed on to the tenant and the tenant bears that cost. Um, so strictly speaking, um, the insurance premiums don't make up a big part of our operating costs for any of the properties we own. Um, and then I guess the other benefit we see is because our industrial portfolio it's predominantly based here in Auckland. We get very good premiums for our tenants. So in a way it does, it can impact on evaluation, but in Auckland Industrial, not, not to any great extent. So no, you know, Wellington office, um, no doubt the premiums have gone up there um, a lot over the last couple of years or the last five years. Um, but yeah, we, we're pretty well insulated from it, it's fair to so. say. Nice. Um, we we'll go on here. Love the asset class, but current cap rates are very compressed with rising interest rates and bond yields already underway. What protection do lease terms have in the terms of rising interest rate environment? Yeah, it's a good question. There's probably two ways that we protect ourselves from that. One is the interest rates. So, um, you know, interest rates are, um, and our interest costs is the largest cost to a company like Property for Industry or any property company. 
Uh, so we have a hedging strategy um, in place that allows us to sort of buffer that out. Um, in terms of the, what, what's driven into the lease, um, so our average lease term is around five years. Um, and typically, if you look at our leases, they have fixed rent reviews. So if we write a, you know, I'm thinking of a lease we've written this week, a 10 year lease, typically we'll have annual fixed increases and you'll have a fixed click of there, maybe two and a half to three percent. So every year it clicks up two and a half to three percent. Uh, then you tend to have a midpoint market review. So after five years, you have a market review where you just ensure that neither party's too far out of market. Um, and then on renewal, you, you go again. So our portfolio, um, every year we're probably reviewing 60% of our rent um, in any one year. Half of that will be fixed and half will be to market. Um, we have CPI reviews on some of our properties. Um, so you'll note CPI has gone up close to 5% in the last 12 months. So any review that's as a CBI clicker in the next 12 months will benefit from there. So, yep, um, property is pretty well insulated, uh, or it's a reflection of the market, I guess. Um, you should pick up the, the CPI growth uh, through your rent reviews. Nice. Um, let's finish on a relatively easy one. Is management employed within the company or is it externally managed? No, we're internally managed. So, I I think you would have picked up in the um, presentation. Originally, PFI was set up as an externally managed contract. Uh, in 2007, the management contract was bought out by the board of directors, uh, and now we are internally managed. So, which is fair to say the preferred, in a listed environment anyway, the preferred um, structure that um, institutional and retail investors should be pushing for. So, internally managed. Um, all right, we've got a couple more questions, but we'll flick those through to you and make sure to get them back to the audience. Um, Great. Very much. Okay, James. Hey, thanks very much for tuning in. Um, and again, if you've got any questions, feel free to send them to James or I'm happy to take them. Um, just email them through woodhams at bfi.co.nz or jump on our website. We like talking to our uh, shareholders. So have a great day. Thanks very much, James. Uh, thank you all for joining. Thank you all the presenters uh, that have had the, taken their time out for us today. Um, with that, let's go get some lunch. For those in Auckland, looks like the sun is still shining. Uh, Waikato as well, hopefully for you as well. Go get some vitamin D. Uh, we'll be holding another one of these in a couple of weeks, so we look forward to seeing you there. We'll be hosting these on our YouTube channel, and we have an Instagram now as well, if you want to go check that out, NZX Limited. Um, and with that, have a great rest of your day. Cheers.